You know, today, this exact day, marks the five-year anniversary of uh, the day we had our first service in Raymond, New Hampshire. Yeah. I didn't want to say that during the vote because I didn't want people to think I was trying to coerce them too much. <laughs> so I save it for now. It's awesome, isn't it? I'd like to just open up with a word of prayer. Father, we are indeed grateful for all that you do. We recognize that you are righteous and holy and good. And your desire for us is, Lord, that we would find ourselves being transformed more and more into your image. It is a work in progress. It is um, a daily consecration that we lay our hearts and our minds and our wills open, Lord, to you to lead and direct. Some days we do awesome. Some days maybe not so much. But you are a God who promises to draw near and never leave. Your desire, Lord, is for us to finish the race, to run with a sense of confidence, to rejoice in the knowledge that you are our God. I pray, Lord, that as we um, open the word, that it would always be a challenge to us so that we might leave with that desire to be that much more conformed into the image of your son. So it's to that end, I pray, Lord, that you would take these words and use them for that very purpose. And we ask this in Christ's name, amen. You know, you open up the, the book of Genesis and we are re immediately confronted with God taking an initiative that he creates a world and causes all of creation to reflect something of his glory and of his goodness. As a height of that creation, he creates man, male and female. He creates them in his divine image and communes with them unlike any other part of his creation. And then a day comes when that fellowship is broken. And that sweet communion is now something that we will spend our lives seeking through God's grace to come back and achieve reconciliation. That kind of rebellion, that kind of sin that entered into the world didn't just affect us. It didn't just affect the relationship with God, it had a spiraling effect so that this life that we were given that was meant to be abundant, meant to be eternal, now we find ourselves living in this mortal flesh with a desire to be clothed with his immortality. We look outside and we see that creation that was created to sustain itself and to be toiled without the sweat of one's brow, now we have to fight against it. And um, we work hard to make sure that we harness all of the various aspects of life so that we can live a sustainable life and a, um, a healthy one. I say all this because what has happened since the fall is men, women have gotten together and tried to come up with strategies on how best to live life. Many of those times God is taken out of that picture. And so they, they try through their own reason and logic to try to get their hands around this world and their lives and they've achieved some pretty tremendous things. But we haven't been able to really fix the deepest issue which is at the core of our hearts. That's why it's kind of interesting if you were just to take a, uh, a walk around a city, uh, let's say a city that you've never been to, and you walk around that city, it wouldn't take you very long before you begin to start taking in the sights and the sounds of that city. 
It wouldn't take very long for you to get a sense of what the citizens of that city hold dear because you would see it reflected in their buildings. You'd see it in their books. You'd see it in their markets. And it would begin to reveal to you what it is that people value. Add into that the, uh, the economic engines of a city or the political powers that are being exerted. And now you get a more complex kind of platform by which to go out and look and see how are these people steering themselves. Political power is an awesome thing, isn't it? It can, when it's used well, it can bring order. It could amend the way a society functions. How are we to bring about change in the broken places of our society are fodder for great debate. Some think we should go about it doing this, and some people think we ought about go about doing this. Everyone's trying to fix a problem. And um, when those opinions clash, passions, man, they run high, don't they? Voices are raised, tempers flare, all in attempt to be the one to steer the ship, to have that power to change, to get things done. Some would prefer an autocratic way, some democratic. Others, let's say, we open it up to discussion, some say too much discussion. That's why I think in the context then of this kind of power that is being exercised, I would like for us to take a look at Acts chapter 19 with that in our minds. Because I don't think it's an accident that in Acts 19, the question of power is front and center. There is a supernatural power, mystical power, a political power, an economic power. And the point is made that God's ministry that is taking place now through Paul and all of those followers are, are stronger than all of the other powers that are being levied against them. In fact, you're going to read in Acts 19, verse 20, where it says, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. So I want you to think about this idea of power. And I have this question. I said, how are we to accomplish great things for God in this world? How are we to accomplish great things for God in the world? We could all have our opinions and we could all, you know, um, try to levy for our position. But at the end of the day, I think God is making it very clear how we are to accomplish great things for him. And I hope in the sermon today to underscore some of those points. And so um, the text really encompasses the whole of chapter 19. It's a long passage, so I didn't put it all in your sermon notes. I just tried to highlight various passages there for you. But if you want, you could certainly take out your Bibles and uh, follow along as well as looking at your sermon notes. But let's start by just reading the first verse here in Acts 19. It says, when Apollos was at Corinth... Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. So I have a map that I just want to, again, reorient us here. And you can see on the, on the left-hand side is Corinth. It was a city that we looked at last week, a very cosmopolitan city, but one that was fraught with all kinds of social ills, so much so that when people used the name Corinthianize, it meant to see something degraded. Paul preaches the gospel there a year and a half and establishes a work. People come to know Christ. There was some opposition, but Paul stayed because the Holy Spirit said to him, don't go. I want you to stay here. I'm going to be with you. I have a lot of people in this city. And so the apostle Paul stays. Now, he crosses that Aegean Sea and he goes into Asia. If you've been following this series along with us, then you realize that salmon colored uh, region of the world here on the top is this dark line. That was the original missionary journey of the apostle Paul when God told him, I don't want you 
to preach the gospel in Asia. That declaration meant that Paul circumvented Asia and started speaking to towns like Iconia, Lystra, Philippi, you know, um, down to Athens, over to Corinth. But he circumvented Asia, I think, because of what we're going to see today is that in Ephesus, the height of power is now being manifested. It was not in Paul's best interest to go there first. <laughs> he learned a lot of things on preaching this gospel and the experiences that he had. So when he finally now comes to Ephesus, he is a seasoned prophet. And he's going to need every bit of that as he confronts the Ephesian city. And why is that? I put in your, in your, in your notes, Ephesus is a great city at the hub of the trade routes of the world, full of culture and money and temples and politics and soldiers, merchants, slaves, and power. Everything we know about Ephesus indicates that it was a place where not only social and civic power, but also religious and spiritual power were concentrated. So Paul has his work cut out for him. But one of the things that Paul learned is what he expressed in this text from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I write that in your text because the, the letter to the Corinthian church was written while Paul was in Ephesus. So I write this just to give you an idea of what's going on in Paul's mind as he is in Ephesus. But he writes to the Corinthians and he makes a very interesting statement. He says, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. In other words, it wasn't built about his personality or his intellect or how clever he was. The message, this gospel, this good news that Jesus was the one who would forgive sins and promise us an abundant life. This message, he says, was not based on my wise or persuasive words but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Now, do you understand what he's saying here in this text? He's saying there is power, and that power resides in the very message that God wants to deliver to the people, because that message has a way of blowing us up that message is going to set people free. That message is going to give people a new sense of identity. That message is what's going to bring people hope, keep them from that brink of despair. That message is the one that's going to help them to engage a world in all of its brokenness and recognize that God has the end in view and all things are going to happen to his good and his glory. So this power, this power then resides not in a personality or in words or in coercion. The power is in simply preaching the good news that Jesus is the savior of the world. Now, having said that then, he's gonna find himself confronting power. And it starts right off. Look at verse 19, verse one. There he found some disciples, asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? See, Paul is asking that question because in Paul's mind, this baptism is a line of demarcation between belief and unbelief. It is a sign, an outward sign that people engaged in that they now are following the Lord. So when he comes to people who are saying we're disciples and they have not been baptized as Jesus said to his, uh, to his followers, remember he says, I want you to go into all the world, right? And make disciples, baptizing them in the what? In the name of the... That's right. So this baptism was a Trinitarian baptism. It is a baptism now in a God who has revealed himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. 
So it wasn't just a Holy Spirit baptism, it was a baptism that identified us with the body of Christ as a result of the work of Jesus on the cross that now poured out his spirit on everyone who would believe. But that baptism was a baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so when he asked them what baptism, they replied, John's baptism. So Paul takes that as an occasion then to say to them, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He makes a demarcation, it's not the same. John's Baptist, if you know the ministry of John, he is this herald that has gone before the Lord to prepare his way. John the Baptist is saying that one is coming. I'm not even worthy to untie the thongs of his sandals. I will decrease and he will increase. I baptize you with water, but when he comes, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so what Paul says to them is that um, he told them, he told the people to believe in the one coming after John, that is Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. You see, that's why I'm saying when it opens up and says, we haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit, it's not that that's some unique kind of a baptism. This is a baptism in the name of Jesus because it's the Father, the Son, the Spirit. And then Paul places his hands on them and the power of that spirit that was manifested in Pentecost, that was manifested in the house of Cornelius is now manifested among these disciples who knew nothing more than John's message. So what I wanna get out of this is simply that the spirit's power that's contained in the gospel is enough to transform lives. This spiritual power to take people and move them to a place of faith is something that the Spirit says, in my words, I can do that. The Lord demonstrates a proactive interest in the souls of those who seek him. Way back, the prophet Jeremiah said, you will seek me and find me if you seek for me with all of your heart. And in the New Testament, do we not hear Jesus saying, he says, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be answered. Ask and it will be given. You see, the Spirit's power can transform a life. And that's why Paul goes out there. And while John's baptism was simply a baptism of preparation, it was a baptism of repentance, Jesus' baptism is an identity with the triune God. I now am following the one who has revealed himself in the person of Jesus. And God now empowers me with the Spirit of God so that I may understand the things that he has given. And everywhere that Paul was going, men and women, whether they were high up on the social ladder or low on the social ladder, people came and they embraced that message and it changed their lives. So much so that the world is talking about what's taking place. But there's something more. Let me start off by reading verse 11 for you and uh, lead us into uh, the passage that's in your your bulletins. I wanna talk about a different kind of power now, a supernatural power. Here it says, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched them were taken to the sick. Their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Again, a demonstration that there is nothing that God can do. If God chooses to use a handkerchief that Paul used to bring somebody healing, or it's his prerogative, it's not ours. But one thing is certain, it's not Paul that's doing it. It's God, it says, did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Paul, on his part, had to be submissive to the will of God that allowed him to go and preach this gospel wherever he went and to live it out. What God did through Paul's life was something that God did. So God is working through the apostle Paul to exhibit extraordinary power. So much so that now look in your verse 13, it says some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. 
Seven sons of Siva, a Jewish uh, chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Awesome, right? <laughs> then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. See, God was exposing counterfeits. It's interesting that in the history there is an mention of this chief priest called Siva, which may give you a sense that here were these, these uh, seven uh, brothers here who, uh, who were just acting by maybe an amalgamation of some Jewish practices and some pagan practices, and they thought that they were going to be able to just recite some kind of incantation, and, uh, and this would be like magic. It would just work. You see what I mean about you can't divorce the submission and humility of the Apostle Paul from the extraordinary work of God. You can't just say a phrase in Jesus' name without having submitted your life to that Jesus. Because if there is that sense of disparity, to put it in the common vernacular, you might just get your butt beat. Verse 17, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, notice the reaction. They were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those, many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to about 50,000 drachmas an estimation of about a few million dollars. And in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. See, God working through the apostle Paul, God working to expose all of these counterfeits, God now works in the lives of people to open their eyes to the counterfeits that are all around them. God's act in the Apostle Paul made it obvious that what they were doing had no power compared to the one who was displaying that power through the one who was preaching the message of God. So I, I, I just think that here again, what is it that people are really looking for? They're, they're trying to find a way, right? They think that these incantations are gonna do it for them. How many Christian people do I know of go to palm readers? Really? What are they gonna tell you? We've been called to live our life according to the righteousness as revealed in Jesus. And these people understood that they were out there, they were, they were buying all the books, anything that they could do to help them manage their life. And in the face of the power of God as it was being displayed, the supernatural could not hold a candlestick. Can I tell you what Paul would write to the Ephesian church one day? And you guys are gonna remember this as soon as I start. The apostle Paul would say this, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. That word schemes there, in the Greek is the word strategia, where we translate our English word strategy. Devil has a strategy, so does God. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You see, that's what we're fighting. This power that has deluded man into thinking that they are the captains of their own destiny. But when the Spirit's power contained in the gospel is unleashed, it exposes all counterfeits. And it will. So spiritual power, supernatural power, what's left? Well, look at Acts 19, 23 through 41. I'm gonna read this story for you and then we'll sum it up in a couple of the texts listed in your bulletin. It starts in verse 23 and it says this. Now about this time, there arose such a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made sh silver shrines of Artemis, 
That's the Greek name of the, go of the Roman goddess Diana. So the temple of, Di of Artemis, the temple of Diana, they're the same. It says, they used to make these silver shrines of Artemis and they brought in no little business for the craftsmen. So he called them together along with the workmen in related trades and he said, men, you know we receive a good income from this business. I think we're gonna start talking about economic power. We make a good business, we make a good business, right? You, and you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. The Spirit's power contained in the gospel, it changes people. And now if there's no power in these man-made gods, then why am I gonna shell out all this money? There's no protection there. There's no hedge against trouble. And at least Demetrius is honest about it. He's saying, this guy is preaching a gospel that is turning everything upside down and it's happening all over the world. So again, I say, this is power. Everywhere he goes, there may be opposition, but that seed is planted and it changes people. So now what happens? He says, there is danger that not only our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself, who is worshiped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. Really? Would you not say that maybe the guy is, is adding on the latter part of this? because his pocket is being affected. This great majesty of Diana, <laughs> of, of Artemis, it's hurting their pockets. He sees this as a threat. He gets the people all wild up. And when they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And soon the whole temple was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and they rushed as one man into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to enter into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people didn't even know why they were there. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front. Some of the crowd shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense for the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. All because some silver, silver shrines are no longer gonna be made and the prophet may be lost. That theater, in Ephesus holds 25,000 people. We have, we have witnessed the kinds of mob scenes where you get all these people together and they're all riled up. Some of the people are those agitators, some of them are in the crowd, they don't even know why they're there. But I would say that would be a threat, don't you think? And so here, Paul has now entered into this whole economic power. What's going to happen? In your text, I put the following verses. It says, the city clerk quieted the crowd. So now we go from economic power to political power because now they got the city clerk involved. And I want you to be very careful to what he says. He says, men of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? That is an illusion to a historical fact that a meteor came down to earth and people looked in that meteor as a sign and they took the shape of this meteor and then they made all these shrines thinking that this was sent from the goddess Diana. So all he does is appeals to everybody's sensibility just to quiet them down. And then he goes on, he says, therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to be quiet and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. 
You know why? Because all they did was in, this, in demonstration of the Spirit's power, they went out and proclaimed the message of Jesus. And the message of Jesus did all the work because it brought people to a place of repentance and change. And the next thing you know, they're bringing in all of their articles. They're repenting from a way of life now. And it is having a, an effect. He goes on, then he says, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open, and so are the pro -councils. They can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we're in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. Why? Because Rome, at this juncture, is demonstrating more and more power, and they could come down really hard on Ephesus. So he's trying hard to keep the peace here. He says, in that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there's no reason for it. And after he said this, he dismissed the assembly. You see, the gospel comes and it begins to shed light on darkness. The gospel declares that there is no power in idols. And perhaps that's why earlier on we read about the people burning their books and stop buying into untruth. Their false hopes were, re, were revealed by the money that people were spending on those books. But now they wanted nothing more to do with that. The gospel declares that we're made in the image of God. Not out of some rock. And as a result, being made in the divine image, we're called to live in a manner that pleases God, which means that I look at all people as those who are imbued with that divine image. And I learn to love my neighbor as I would love myself because I am now motivated by the highest principle of a God who reveals himself in righteousness and goodness. But that's not to say that the gospel is not going to have opposition. It will. Can I just tell you two things in our culture today that that just underscores this in spades here? Look at the drug traffic. Something that we all say is horrendous. It's, it's killing our young people. It's destroying cities. It's, it's destroying communities, homes. People stand in that gap and they want, to, they want to expose this. Do we not see how the evil one then just raises up people and how that illegal activity, their source of income is now threatened, and they'll take people out. They'll kill them. What about sex trafficking? Right here in our own Hampton Beach, they bring in these young women, put them up in these hotels, all for a profit. You go, down, you go downtown and you extricate them. Let me tell you, there are people who now you have messed with their pocketbook and they will not be happy. I get it. I love what one writer says. He says, when wickedness gets a grip on a society, someone needs to take their courage in one hand and their Bible in the other. They need to throw to the winds any caution about their own prospects and say what needs to be said. The Apostle Paul was such a guy. There are men and women throughout history who decided that they are going to follow Jesus rather than the course of this world. They put themselves in harm's way for the good of their neighbor because they love that young girl that is being exploited, because they love that young man who is bringing such grief and harm to himself, to his family and to the community. People stand up and they preach a gospel that sets men and women free. It's power. And none of that spiritual, supernatural, economic, political power, none of it could stand in the face of a God who's on a mission. And that's why I just say here, the Spirit's power that's contained in this gospel affects culture. 
You want to change culture? Then start with your own life being fixed on the person of Jesus. Live that out in a consistent way. Speak about that to your neighbors, to your friends, to your families, and watch how God begins to amount such a people that a difference can be made in the communities in which they're living. That's why Demetrius can say, these guys, they're causing trouble all over the world. Got that right. My last point, it comes again from a text that I have in your bulletins from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Again, let me remind you that this book was written as Paul was leaving Ephesus. So all the experiences that he had there confronting these various levels of power, I want you to see the effect that it had on him. He says, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships that we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. Do you understand what he's saying? That as Paul would go out and that word of, uh, the, 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 it says the word of Jesus would spread wildly and, and his power would begin to be seen, it was not without a cost. We're not told all of what happened. There are little snippets that you could read about it in the letters. But what we're told here in 1 Corinthians that all of that that happened to Paul had a way of causing him to despair, even of life, so that he had within himself the sentence of death. You gotta be pretty low. Our visions of the Apostle Paul being this victorious guy, nothing seems to really bother him, is false. He was down. But then this gospel that he's been preaching to everybody else, Notice here in this text, it says, but this happened that we may not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So I may have these feelings inside that leave me so that I feel as if I'm dead inside. And God's saying, just the place that I can do a work because I can raise the dead. And that message that Paul was delivering everywhere he went, confronting the spiritual, supernatural, economic, political powers of his day, is the same gospel that's going to renew that hope that is within him. Because the Spirit's power contained in the gospel will sustain us. That's why you can't let it go. That's why that is the gospel that wherever God opens a door of opportunity for us, we're gonna rush through that door because the gospel is going to change people and communities until he comes. And it is worth every ounce of effort that we can bring forth. Let us not shrink back. Eternity is in the balance. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for these stories that are not redacted, they're not cleaned up. Very often the hearts of man are being displayed. And yet what is also, Lord, center stage is that your will and your purpose will never be thwarted. There is no power that man can levy that can stop this tide of righteousness from rising. The only way it stops is when we seek to pay heed to the message. When the salt loses its savor, when the light is hidden, It has nothing to do with us. We are simply conduits for your power to be demonstrated. So keep us faithful, keep us focused from this day forward. 
And we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.